Hey everybody, uh, Yogi Philosopher here. And um, so for today, I'm gonna give the first of a two part lecture called Women, Philosophy and Democracy. Uh, this part one is on Nietzsche and the pre-Socratics. And it's gonna be, both these lectures are gonna be talking about my new book that just came out. Uh, the book is called Nietzschean Feminist and Embodied Perspectives on the Pre-Socratics. Subtitle of Philosophy is Partnership. And uh, I'll put a link in the description for anybody who wants to buy it and read it on your own. Uh, but for those of you who don't, and just kind of what like the Cliff Notes version of it, um, I'm going to be giving these, uh, you know, these two lectures. And so for this first one, we're going to talk about the first part of the thesis of my book. The book has a two-part thesis, and the first part um, argues that despite Nietzsche's um, traditional or traditionally male-centered reading of the pre-Socratic philosophers, who were the first Western philosophers, um, his, he nevertheless shows us how we can see that uh, Western philosophy really began as what we today would call a feminist religious reform movement. Um, and so pretty much, you know, some feminists have argued, uh, not unjustifiably, that Western philosophy, you know, literally began with the exclusion of women. Uh, but I show that that is, that is not the case. And um, a big major theme of my work is that this isn't just important from a scholarly, intellectual, or academic perspective. Uh, this is important uh, for, cult for culture, specifically academic culture, and then for Western democracy. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to get to that later. And so for this talk, I'm really just going to lay out the basic way that I make my argument. Uh, and so first is explaining in one sense how Nietzsche enables us to do this. And what it is, it's he he read the first philosophers, the pre-Socratics, as primarily being religious reformers. So Western philosophy for him began as a religious reformation. Uh, and this has been uh, substantially confirmed by recent scholarship that has uh, illustrated the centrality of theological concerns and the uh, centrality of the interest in reforming religion for the pre-Socratics, specifically uh, reacting or reforming Homeric or Hesiod or Hesiodic uh, religion. And, but that begs the question, what was the nature of this reform? You know, what, was, what were they trying to do? And so I pretty much argue that the pre-Socratics were trying to revive within the largely patriarchal and death-glorifying uh, what we could call um, necrophilic uh, culture of, our, of archaic Greece. They were trying to revive within this culture, specifically a paleolithic goddess-centered religiosity of rebirth. So emphasizing women instead of men and emphasizing rebirth instead of uh, death. And so the way I do this, uh, it's specifically through two, a two-pronged thing, which is historical connections and then conceptual similarities. And so Nietzsche saw, or at least maintained, that Greek metaphysics and Greek cosmology have their origin in the Greek mysteries. And specifically the Eleusinian mysteries are, were very ancient. And the Eleusinian mysteries uh, really... What I do in the second chapter of my book is I trace uh, the influence or trace the, um, the development of goddess spirituality from Paleolithic Old Europe through the Neolithic Near East and like sites like Chitalia Yuk to Minoan Crete and then from Minoan Crete, Crete to the Eleusinian Mysteries because the Eleusinian Mysteries, you know, derive from or at least you know, significantly influenced by Minoan Crete. So, and the Eleusinian Mysteries were a major influence on all of Greek life, but especially the pre-Socratic. So right there, you have a historical link from pre-Socratic philosophy through the Eleusinian mysteries to Paleolithic Europe. But uh, secondly, there are the conceptual similarities. And what I mean by that is specifically what I call feminine simplicity or cyclicity. Uh, so in old European myths, there was generally a portrayal of goddesses directing the cycles of life, death, and rebirth. And then we see the same kind of, uh, again, femininity and cyclicity in pre-Socratic thought that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and so now that, you know, that's pretty much the general way that I'm making the argument. And so what I'm going to do now is really just go through the major pre-Socratic thinkers one by one uh, to give you a general sense of the narrative. So within this context, um, the consistently positive portrayal of women that we see 
the goddess imagery, as well as the um, predominance of rebirth in pre-Socratic cosmology, it really all, for me, is traced back to Paleolithic Europe. So what we're doing here is we're tracing the origin of pretty much Western cosmology to uh, Paleolithic European goddess spirituality. And so we're going to start with uh, a figure um, lesser known called Phericides. And so Phericides is usually excluded from pre-Socratic thinking because he's ten he tends to be viewed as more of a theological thinker. But um, nevertheless, he was highly significant. And for our purposes, um, and I should say when we do this, we're going to be talking about both biographical details about the thinkers as well as their doctrines. So biographically, uh, Phericides was known to abhor violence. You know, he was relatively known to be a peaceful character as well as uh, a singer as well. And so, um, but besides the biographical details, there's two um, major important things about his theology or theocosmology that are kind of set the stage for the kind of, you know, what I'll call the, a feminist or um, partnership religious reformation that we'll see throughout pre-Socratic thinkers is first of all, he has Zos, which is his version of Zeus, you know, on, and albeit a male god, uh, creating the world through feminine crafts. So we have like weaving. So we have the world coming to be in a feminine way. And also in contrast to the kind of rapey sexual violence that we see in other aspects of Greek mythology, he portrays uh, the uh, relationship between Zos and the goddess Chthoni as being what as being characterized by, by what we would call romantic love. So we have the world coming to be in a feminine way. We have um, a kind of romantic you know, partnership between a male and a female god here. And, you know, so that's kind of getting us started. And you can already kind of see the breaking away from the, you know, like the violent kind of rapiness of, of other aspects of Greek myth. But now we're going to turn to uh, Thales, who is regularly regarded as the first, um, the, the, the first Western philosopher. And with uh, respect to biographical information, he was reported to have shared um, Phericides is like joyful musicality. So again, just kind of like a gentle, artistic, um, you know, lifestyle, a way of being. Um, but he's also recorded to have, have praised his mother's intelligence. So right there at the beginning of the first Western philosopher, we have praising of a strong, uh, intelligent mom. And then with respect to his doctrine, so Thales is known to have you know, famously said that all is water, that underlying all the changes of the empirical world you know, water is the hypokamenon, is the, the substrate. And so effectively, his water functions or fulfills the same cosmic function as old European goddesses, namely directing the cyclical change of life, death, and rebirth. But besides just being functionally equivalent, um, the fact that Malaysian philosophy, and Thales, uh, like an examander, he's a Malaysian from Miletus, uh, Malaysian philosophy was part of the same kind of stream or ran within the same circles as Orphism. And Orphic, Orphics routinely would um, symbolize Orphic goddesses in, you know, allegory, symbols, or, you know, any, anything like that. And so using that connection, I argue that Thales' water is really a symbolic uh, personification or abstract, you know, uh, representation of the aqueous goddess Matis. Matis is a goddess of wisdom. Uh, there's a lot that we could say about her, but we'll just keep this um, short for now. And so pretty much Western philosophy beginning, not just with Phericides and his kind of prepping the way there, but with Thales beginning with a um, ontological primacy of the feminine, kind of a divine cosmic femininity, again, doing the same kind of things of, of cyclical rebirth. And we see this in the next major philosopher we'll consider, which is Anaximander, a relative contemporary of Thales. And so there's not much biographical information we have of him. We'll, we'll speak a little bit about it in a second. Um, but from a doctrinal perspective, so unlike Thales, Anaximander said like, or you know, he reasoned, if all the qualities in our world come to be and perish, the underlying substrate, the eternal you know, being, that has to be without qualities, and that's the apyron. And commentators have described described his apyron as being a feminine maternal principle. Specifically, it does really function as the mother of the gods, which is kind of you know an Orphic kind of thing here. But there's also several other aspects um, 
of an Anaximander's thought, which tie into the trajectory of the kind of partnership reform that we're going to be talking about. Uh, one is the democratic, or what has been described as the democratic uh, structure of his cosmos. So like for Anaximander, the cosmos is very, uh, it, it's symmetrical, you know, with the earth floating uh, in the middle of uh, the cosmos surrounded by these rings. And commentators have argued that the symmetry of the cosmos is actually a rejection to imbalances of power like one would find in the political sphere. So you already have, a, again, a more kind of peaceful, you know, democratic uh, mentality being portrayed in the very structure of his cosmos. But besides that, the world, even though Anaximander's cosmos is very violent in a lot of ways, he does describe it coming to be coming to be in a nurturing way where from the two elements of fire and air, fire uh, created like a kind of cocoon or protective bark away or around air. You know, it's all very complex and you, know, read, you can read more about this in the book, but pretty much the world is coming, not just has a kind of uh, democratic symmetry, but also comes to be in a more nurturing, one could say maternal way, which ties into his uh, apiron being a maternal uh, principle, a feminine principle, despite its being gender neutral um, in a way. But finally, and specifically with regard to Hesiod, Anaximander reforms the insalubrious origin of women in Hesiod's Pandora myth by maintaining that men and women were, were created at the same time. So right here we have just a, a, a move in the direction of not just goddess spirituality, but uh, gender equality, uh, which is significant. <laughs> you know, And that's just one of the many pieces of the puzzle that uh, we'll be talking about. And so just to kind of move on from there, we're going to get to Pythagoras now. And Pythagoras is a very key figure in my argument. Uh, he's one of the few pre-Socratics who has been called a feminist uh, in the literature. Uh, and not for, you know, you know, bad reasons, but for good ones. Uh, he's known for his inclusion of women. He was known to have learned or reported to have learned most of what he learned from a Delphic priestess. And there's a legend of him having a golden thigh, which may be a reference to him having a tattoo on his thigh that marked him as an adept in the lineage of Matis, the goddess that we just mentioned, and or Demeter or Demeter. So we have really strong, uh, what I call, a, a, you know, partnership credentials here of women affirming, peaceful, you know, these kinds of things. And he also brought, you know, um, reincarnation to the fore of pre-Socratic thought. And the significance of Pythagoras derives from, he's arguably the most influential pre-Socratic thinker. All the others tend to be portrayed as followers of him. And so if this most influential figure of pre-Socratic philosophy is also so strongly or significantly pro-women and pro-reincarnation, you know, that really um, says a lot about how we can understand the general trend of pre-Socratic thinking and what was happening. And then finally, um, a later Pythagorean Philolaus um, has a heart, hearth, a fire, which the Greek word is Hestia, at the center of his cosmos. And Hestia was also a goddess. And so I also interpret Philolaus's later Pythagorean thinking as another instance of the continuation of this Paleolithic European worldview of a goddess, you know, pretty much directing the cycles of, of life, death, and rebirth. Uh, and so moving on from Pythagoras, we're getting to Heraclitus now. And so with respect to um, the biographical information, Heraclitus was uh, known to have a you know, musical style of writing, but also an affirmation of children. You know, he was very, you know, prefer to be around kids other than adults and very kind of a nurturing kind of figure in that way. And that also recalls the one thing or one of the things that we do know about Anaxagoras is that he is reported to have saying that um, apparently he was singing and he wasn't doing a, a good enough job and the kids were making fun of him. So we said, you know, I need to learn how to sing better for the children. And so again, it's just feeding into this kind of the vibe that we get from the biographical details of the pre-Socratic thinkers as being, you know, gentle, nurturing, artistic souls, you know. But uh, with respect to doctrine, um, Heraclitus does have the feminine figures of the Aranes and Justice, um, conduct or ensure astronomical regularity. So we have feminine figures, again, conducting or directing uh, the cycles of nature. And for him, everything comes from strife. And his word for strife is a feminine word called eris. So you have 
feminine figures directing the cycles of nature and you have the source of all things at least being uh, referred to by a feminine noun there. Um, and um, another major contribution of Heraclitus is he offers a kind of explanation for reincarnation, taking it beyond a kind of belief, uh, explaining reincarnation as um, a process of elemental transformation, which also goes back to uh, arguably to Thales. But one last thing uh, with the biographical uh, information, Heraclitus is known to have dedicated his book to, um, to Artemis at the Temple of Artemis. So we have here a specific um, explicit connection between pre-Socratic writing specifically, and, and goddess worship. And he was also known to be a uh, priest of Eleusinian Demeter. So besides just the kind of nurturing, um, <laughs> albeit, you know, maybe sensitive, hypersensitive side of Heraclitus, he was known as, you know, the weeping philosopher. Um, we also have direct ties to, you know, important goddess spirituality here. Uh, and so moving on from that, we have Parmenides. And so for Parmenides is like the apex of my argument with respect to the conceptual similarities uh, between pre-Socratic thought or cosmology and Paleolithic Europe um, mythology. So Parmenides' poem is highly feminine insofar as every figure, including the animals in the poem, is feminine except for the Kuros, the male journeyer, who's going to meet Parmenides' goddess, which... Um, we can't identify with Persephone from the Eleusinian Mysteries, um, but Persephone is a big influence on, on Parmenides here. Um, he also portrays being itself, you know, the eternal being that, that uh, subtends empirical reality as being held together by feminine love. And his cosmology explicitly has his goddess of being um, directing the cycles of life, death, and rebirth. So it's the conceptual similarities are evident you know, undeniable between Parmenides and, um, and um, pre or um, excuse me, Paleolithic European myth. But finally, with Parmenides, um, I argue in the book that, I, that for him, philosophical divinization, the kind of becoming divine that takes place via philosophy over successive lifetimes, it's also a cultivation of a specifically feminine form of subjectivity and embodiment. So pretty much becoming a philosopher is becoming feminine in this way and divine in this way, the feminine and the divine being intimately intertwined for Parmenides. Um, and so if Parmenides provides us with the kind of zenith of like the conceptual link between pre-Socratic cosmology and old European myth, Empedocles, a rough contemporary of Parmenides, provides us with a strong historical link. And so biographically, Empedocles shares many of the same traits that we've been talking about. And specifically one that we haven't mentioned, I don't think so far, is anti-materialism, a kind of aversion to money and power, which again, just kind of ties into the kind of gentle uh, personality trait or personality tendencies that we, we see. But there's also explicit reports of him healing women and also using his wealth to pay for dowries for young women who couldn't afford it. So again, biographical information just really tying into this. But with Empedocles, so in his cyclical cosmology, there's a part um, where all earthly beings are kind of absorbed into this divine figure, his spherical god, which to be sure is a male god. But um, the kind of um, thing, the entity, it's not just a god, it also has been interpreted as a superorganism, kind of an ideal society. And commenters have argued that this version of Empedocles' uh, cosmology may be a memory of more peaceful Neolithic societies, a more, li ne more yeah, peaceful Neolithic societies uh, that were the memory for which was retained in folk memories. You know, and I think Rihanna Eisler even uh, attributed this to, this to Hesiod as well. So once again, Parmenides, we have the kind of conceptual similarities at their height, but with Empedocles in the scholarly literature, he has already been tied to memories of a pre-existing, more peaceful society. So this just really lends a lot of credit to my position that this is what the pre-Socratics, generally speaking, were doing. We're trying to revive an older, more peaceful, goddess-oriented you know, kind of culture within archaic Greece. Uh, however, unfortunately, after Parmenides and Anempedocles, both explicit goddess imagery as well as rebirth really fall out of pre-Socratic thought. And I argue that that has to do um, with the higher influence that Sophism 
exerted on, on the last two pre-Socratic thinkers that we're going to think of. And so a major, uh, another major theme of this book, as well as my second book, um, is you know, defining what philosophy is, and that entails saying what it's not, and the difference between philosophy and sophism. And so in contrast to the, you know, all the kind of good stuff that we've been seeing in the history of pre-Socratic philosophy, sophists, the first one, Large, or it has been argued that Simonides really set the template for Sophism. And there, in contrast to pre-Socratics, we see a materialism, uh, a nihilism, and specifically a misogyny. And so I argue that this, the higher influence of Sophism on the last two pre-Socratic thinkers helps explain why rebirth and goddess imagery or explicit goddess imagery fall away. And so first, uh, we have Anaxagoras. And so with Anaxagoras, we also have the first... Um, noticeable, you know, according to my view, uh, instance of misogyny or the negative portrayal of women in pre-Socratic writing or in, in, you know, in the pre-Socratic world. And so the way this fleshes out is that, so for Anaxagoras, there's the cosmic noose, which is like the cosmic mind that exists separately from material reality. And it's, um, it has been argued that a major influence for his cosmos is the um i want to say the the shaman or the, uh, the the spiritual figure of hermotimus so hermotimus was known to leave his body and you know his soul would journey around and then re return to his body and that's maybe where anaxagoras got the idea for cosmic noose but it was also reported that hermotimus while he was out and about you know soul traveling his wife killed him to prevent him from coming back. And that's why women are no longer allowed at his uh, tomb. And so here we have like kind of a first, in my reading and through my research, the first you know, negative portrayal of women in pre-Socratic thought or in the, in the, in the extant fragments that we have. Um, and also Anaxagoras just completely, you know, he just rejects uh, rebirth. So again, and Democritus, like Anaxagoras, rejects rebirth even though in both of their cosmologies, it is literally entailed. And I make this point specifically, even though for Anaxagoras and Democritus, their thoughts literally entail the existence of reincarnation, both of them deny it. And so it's interesting to speculate why they would do that. Um, but finally, with Democritus, we also have the first instance of an explicitly misogynistic statement or statements, pretty much boiling down to women are more evil or more inclined to evil. Um, and so again, I attribute this to the influence of Sophism um, here. But that being said, uh, Anaxagoras and Democritus still, I include within the kind of partnership tradition that I'm tracing in pre-Socratic philosophy because they still, um, in the biographical information, exhibit many of the traits that I've been listing, you know, a love of learning and aversion to political power, uh, and even Democritus, a deference to Dem Demeter and to women in general. And it should be noted that, that uh, the uh, misogynistic uh, statements in Democritus, they may not be Democritus' own. They may go back to Democrates, who's obviously you know, confused with um, Democritus. So that's why even though we can see Anaxagoras and Democritus as a kind of decline from what I call you know, the kind of partnership um, religious reformation that we see in pre-Socratic thinking, we can still include them in pre-Socratic thought. And the significance of that comes from how Democritus has as strong a claim as other Greeks do to being the first one to use the word democracy. So it's in this way that the very, either the concept or at least the term democracy originated or likely originated from a philosophical tradition that in turn was a continuation of goddess spirituality. So in this way, demo, demo, excuse me, democracy is tied into this goddess religiosity. And so that's what I'm going to be really vamping on um, in the next lecture, where I'm going to talk about um, pretty much the, the significance of this. Again, like um, I'm undoing a lot of many, many years of uh, the traditional portrayal of the origination of Western philosophy, primarily from a male perspective. Uh, and I argue that this new account of Western philosophy gives us a better model of philosophy, or at least a model of philosophy that is more able to deal with the crises or the challenges of democracy in the 21st century. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much it. Uh, again, like feel free uh, to read the book for all the, the juicy details and all, um, all the other stuff. 
because uh, it's a great introduction to pre-Socratic thought. It, it really, I try to be as comprehensive as I can. You'll get uh, a cutting edge understanding of pre-Socratic thinking, as well as an up-to-date uh, assessment of Nietzsche's reading of all the pre-Socratics. And so, you know, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope this has got you thinking, you know, uh, if there's anything else you'd like me to speak about in the future, feel free to leave comments. Feel free to like this and subscribe to my channel, all that good stuff. You can find me on, you know, Facebook and Instagram, Yogi Philosopher, all that good stuff. And um, I think that's about it. So, yeah, I'll see you next time.